Hi there, everyone. I'm Shivani with Go Engineer. My background is in aerospace and mechanical engineering, and I've been a SolidWorks and simulation specialist working out of Go Engineer's Houston office for about four years. In this webinar, we're focusing on the nonlinear module obtained from the SolidWorks Simulation Premium License. The nitinol material type is only available in nonlinear and the time-based and large displacement analyses I need to analyze the stent is also only available in nonlinear. I want to focus on the nonlinear material model, nitinol. The three use cases on the nitinol stent and then three major post-processing options inside of simulation. So starting off with the material model, this here is a typical stress strain curve for nitinol. Uh, the word nitinol comes from nickel titanium alloy, which is a type of shape memory alloy, meaning it returns to its original shape after it's been deformed. Within simulation, nitinol is the material model type we choose when we're creating a custom material. The material model type being named nitinol doesn't mean you're forced to use a nickel titanium alloy. It really works for any shape memory alloy. For example, some other less common ones out there are copper zinc aluminum. Cheaper but less good compared to nitinol. These curves for a nitinol material model are made up of stiff regions as well as soft regions. The stiff region follows a slope defined by SOLIDWORKS's elastic modulus, whereas the soft region, which I can call a super elastic region, maintains nearly a constant stress over a long range of strain. This is happening because of a phase transition from a very ordered crystalline structure to a less ordered crystalline structure. So during the loading process, it follows this way, and unloading, it follows this way, in the reverse, on the compressive side. Now, since a large portion of the stress-strain curve is basically constant stress, we can't use nitinol in SOLIDWORKS simulations fatigue analysis, because a fatigue analysis in SOLIDWORKS depends on stress versus number of cycles, and it's very hard to determine different number of cycles for this amount of stress. So in order to properly define a nitinol material model like this, I do need eight separate data points. These are going to be the yield stress data points, each of the inflection points of this curve. Just following the balloons here, we can see that there are four different yield stress points for loading and unloading in tension. The same goes for compression. Each of those data points are input into SOLIDWORKS. However, the picture I have over here only has data for tensile loading. This is technically okay in this particular scenario. As long as I'm applying tensile loading on my CAD model, the simulation will load just fine. So if I scroll down further in this menu, I would get to this other property, the ultimate plastic strain measure and then tension in parentheses. And this is just the ultimate plastic strain measured in tension. It's commonly notated EUL, which is just the area of the stress strain curve where the metal is likely to break. If I leave this value blank, which I can, the solver is going to default to the value 0 0.075. Now this value is multi-axial, so it's the ultimate plastic strain in all different axes. However, when I'm creating this stress strain curve, I'm very likely running a lab test using a uniaxial tension test. So I'm going to be getting ultimate plastic strain in a uniaxial direction. I need to convert that into a multi-axial value. Uh, SOLIDWORKS recommends you just multiply that uniaxial value by the square root of 3 halves and just type in this number into your material model in SOLIDWORKS. Then if I scrolled down some more, I would get to the exponential flow rate 
measurements for tensile and compressive loading. Taking a look at this picture over here, between the dots and the dashes in the straight line, you can see different mathematical interpolations between the two yield stresses for two different curves. Generally, having an exponential flow rate measurement does create a more accurate material model. However, not all shape memory alloys are very dependent on the speed of transformation. In terms of SOLIDWORKS simulation, as long as you have the eight yield stresses and the ultimate plastic strain, you don't technically need the exponential flow rate measurement. As the slide says, if you leave this blank, SOLIDWORKS will assume a linear line between the two yield stress points. Now having run my uniaxial test, and put my data into SOLIDWORKS, I need to test that material model on a comparable SOLIDWORKS CAD model. I'd recommend drawing up a similar shaped rod or strip, applying the user-defined knit null material to it, and running your analysis. I got this component from the help menu, SOLIDWORKS simulation, validation verification problems. This is a way to test SOLIDWORKS simulation against known analytical solutions. In this case, they have a knit null stent with lab data for a particular cantilever analysis. And they run that analysis for three different material knit null models and compare against the lab data. In my scenario, I'm just testing the knit null material against, say, the lab data that I have myself. So what I would do is first cut up my component to be symmetrical along two planes. This way I can apply a load on the third face and have everything act symmetrically, equal and opposite reactions. That's what I've done here with two SOLIDWORKS simulation symmetry restraints and the on flat faces in tension. Since this is nonlinear, I can apply this tensile curve to be loading over the first second and unloading over the second second. And let me run the analysis and we get some stresses and displacements changing over time. But what I would really like to look at is the time history plots. These are always defined on a per node basis and I can click any node on my part file. For simplicity, I'll pick this one over here. That's going to be node one. And what I would like to create is basically the stress strain curve for the knit null material type. However, in the x axis direction, I don't have strain. Displacement is as close as I can get. So I'll check this out and I can basically see the shape of my knit null material model here. I don't want to compare these values against lab data. And if they basically matched, I would feel more comfortable using this material model in my actual design work. Now a knit null stent is used basically like this. It's pushed into a blood vessel with a balloon in the center. The balloon is inflated and then removed, leaving the stent in place. If I was going to analyze this in SOLIDWORKS simulation, I would also need to know the stiffness of the compressed plaque and the blood vessel itself. So for the first analysis we're going to run, let's set this up, taking that assumption. This outer cylinder could represent the plaque or the blood vessel wall. I would just need to have two of them if I was going to use both. I have cut this in half. Symmetry restraints are always useful. And then getting into setting up the analysis here. You study, nonlinear, hit OK. Start from the top of the tree. The stent was made using SOLIDWORKS sheet metal features, which imports this component as a sheet metal thin shell element type of model. This is good for a speedy calculation, but not good for accuracy. So I'm going to treat this as a solid with a right click. And then we apply our custom material that we made before, and I tested on my axial rod. Just to look at the data real quick, I've got elastic modulus, Poisson's ratio, eight different data points for yield, and the ultimate plastic strain. The rest is blank. So I'll apply that, hit OK, 
and then think about what to do for the outer cylinder. Again, this is representing either the, the plaque or the blood vessel wall. So I would need another custom material for that. However, I don't have one for that biological material. So for now, I'll just represent it with some rubber with some really low stiffness. Next area is connections. By default, any touching face is going to be treated as bonded, which is perfectly welded. That's not going to work in this scenario. I do need them to slide against each other. So we would use the contact set between the outside face of the stent and the inside face of the cylinder. That's usually okay, but let's get into the advanced area. Note to surface is faster to solve, but generally less accurate than surface to surface. However, in this scenario, there's not a lot of major sliding. The nodes are going to stay basically lined up, so I'm okay with sticking with node to surface. Next is our fixtures. First, I need to do my symmetry restraint on the back cut faces. Ultimately, what I'm aiming for is each of the components being restrained in the X, Y, and Z directions in some way. I gotta make sure I click every single face that was cut, even though the preview showed up earlier in my clicks. All right. So the symmetry restraint is going to define these components in the X axis, but I still need some Y and Z direction restraints. To represent that, we will use an expansion constraint. For that, I've got multiple ways to do so. I could use reference geometry on a cylindrical face. And then for this, pick a face edge plane or axis to define the coordinate system. Or use on cylindrical faces, which automatically uses the cylindrical coordinate system as a result of whatever axis runs to the center of this cylinder. I could also define that axis again back in use reference geometry, this pink box, in an axis I would have made myself. So clicking over to that axis converts my XYZ into the cylindrical coordinate system. This first uh, defines the expansion. Good, exactly what I'm looking for. And then I could choose the others. Do I need to keep it from rotating or keep it from moving axially? Technically, no. This expansion is enough to hold it in the Y and Z direction, so that'll be good. At that point, mesh and run, and we should start seeing results like this. Now, I do want to get into some of the post-processing of these stress results. The first I want to discuss is just the properties of each of these plots and how they relate to the pseudo time of nonlinear. Uh, this first, I can look at specific uh, seconds of time in the pseudo time. But ultimately, I don't want to click through this way. I would rather click through using the plot steps. Now, in some other scenarios, what's really interesting is actually choosing plot bounds across all steps, which gives me an option for max or min. So I'm seeing the max stress on this plot now. Something also to be aware of is the deformation scale. For a large displacement analysis, we recommend true scale so we can actually s see how the part is deforming. If I stuck with the automatic choice, which has a deformation scale of about 10.5, I'm seeing a much larger faked deformation. This deformation scale exists to make deformation more obvious in the scenarios where deformation isn't very large. Second, perhaps I want to output numerical results. So I would do that using the probe tool. I get to this by right clicking on any plot that I have active. Now there's a handful of options here. What I just need to do is click on some random points on the model. It's going to throw out some nodal stresses on those points. I could perhaps use that to find the max like this. Now, more realistically, I'm not clicking around randomly for my nodes. I'm using unselected entities. You can click faces or edges. What I like to do is click actually the entire part file. 
and get an output of every single stress result on all the various nodes. I can then sort those values by clicking on the column header and take a look at perhaps the top five maximum stresses. So besides just being able to see this, I can save these clicks so I don't have to do them again. That's called saving these nodes as a sensor. It's in the report options icon. Clicking this is going to let you use the from sensors option in probe. And I can actually use this in any sort of plot that I've created. As I go back to probe, I'm going to see from sensors and be able to pick the sensor I just created with the displacement results now at those five nodes. These probe results can be plotted. They can be exported to Excel. But essentially, this is the way that I get numerical data. A third thing I wanted to talk about was deformed bodies and getting the displacement of those. First up, if you have any level of simulation, in a displacement plot, you can use distance in probe to measure between two points. You'll get x, y, z of those two points. Or if you have at least SOLIDWORKS simulation professional or higher, you can right click on the results folder and save this body as a deformed shape. This new body can be imported into your assemblies to check for interference or just to do your own displacement calculations using the SOLIDWORKS's evaluate measure tool. So that's it for this webinar. Again, we looked over the knit null material models and some various use cases on a stent. Thank you guys for tuning in. And again, I'm Shivani Patel with Go Engineer. Mm -hmm.